watching the ASP Productions on YouTube. Rule of 47 here, ASP Tactical. I'm here with Brian, and he's going to go over his gear and weapons. So, take it out. Okay, I'm portraying a soldier in the 94th Infantry. The 94th Infantry was activated in 1942 in Kalamazoo um, and fought all the way through the war until uh, the end of 45 and ending up in Germany and then Czechoslovakia. Right now, what I'm portraying is a soldier of the 94th Infantry at Camp McCain, Mississippi in 1944. We're training to go state, uh, we're training to go from uh, stateside to possibly the European theater or possibly to Japan. We're not entirely sure yet. So the soldiers were being trained in all forms of uh, combat, firearm speciality, as well as what to expect when they got overseas. Uh, one particular uh, item of interest that I'm wearing is the gas mask. Okay. Uh, often used, is called a kidney bag, is the uh, bag is being kept in. With the horrors of World War I, soldiers were uh, trained in having heard stories from their fathers and relatives of the gas that was used during the war. So every soldier that we see in stateside training is carrying this gas mask and they were expecting to go overseas and use them. However, it looks like most of the guys ended up ditching them as soon as they saw the field and they realized that gas wasn't gonna be prevalent. However, whenever you see them training, they're using a gas mask. I so have that gas mask inside here. So this was a just-in-case type of thing over yes. in the theater. Well, considering what it looked like, during World War One, you see, you know, image, all the horrible images of guys who have been poisoned with mustard gas, you know, the blind leading the blind essentially in a, in a procession. They prepared for everything. They especially figured that as soon as we hit the continent of Europe having invaded, that Hitler was going to get desperate and use gas. However, we know in, in hindsight that that wasn't true. The soldiers then were not entirely sure. So they were trained intensely with gas. They would need to do everything with this gas mask on. Uh, if you want, I can demonstrate at least what the gas mask looks like while on. Sure. Okay. Right ahead. Were you guys in the game too? Oh, sorry. Once the gas mask is on, they need to adjust the straps so it fit tightly on their face. It helped to prevent any seal leaks. Then, reattach the helmet. So this is essentially what the GI would have looked like wearing everything on. It's very cumbersome, very uh, tough to breathe in. Obviously, it's meant to filter out the gas, but the soldiers would eventually learn it's heavy, it's cumbersome, especially when worn on their flank and they would just ditch them. But again, like I said, every photo we see of the 94th, if they're training, they have three things on. Cartridge belt, gas mask, and usually a helmet. Luckily, gas was not used during the war. Uh, another thing that's interesting is you see that I'm wearing the uh, camouflage coveralls. Yeah, what's that? Um, a lot of people associate them with the Marine Corps. However, early war in 1942-43, a program was developed to get these into use uh, to camouflage ourselves better. The problem is, when the GIs finally did deploy with these, we were being confused with the Germans. If you could tell, it's kind of similar to a German camouflage pattern. Okay. So when we, uh, the United States troop got over the European theater of operations, there's a lot of, as we call, friendly fire casualties due to the Americans looking very similar to the Germans. Mm -hmm. A lot of stateside pictures of the 94th, they're wearing the full coveralls. That's why I have it. It's one piece, top to bottom. Top to bottom has in, internal suspenders. That's why when we do this event, I wear the, the coveralls because it is, again, seen stateside. Okay. Uh, other than that, my basic field kit, I normally carry an M1 carbine, so I'm wearing a carbine belt, a pistol mm -hmm. belt with carbine pouches. I have my 45 holster, my 28 dismount ca uh, canteen, and quite often I would carry my, um, my medical pouch, but today I'm not wearing it. Okay. Just for the sake of it being so cumbersome with everything else on with you know the gas mask and the holster at this time that's a lot of gear carrying it is yeah. it's not the most they would have carried a full uh, full equipped troop could have been wearing the long uh, 28 uh, haversack with extended blanket and all their, their excessive gear they're meant to be able to hold enough gear for about three days on their own yeah uh, one interesting thing I'm wearing today my helmet has a Holly liner which is the early pressed fiber liner Oh wow. So these unfortunately didn't hold up very well, especially especially in moisture. We later go to the composite fiber, which is used in our high pressure liners, yeah. but this is considered a low pressure and it would often fall apart. You can see the lining mark that says liner M1 fiber on the inside. I have a map inside of some B-mail. 
Uh, soldiers often carry their um, loved one's picture or whatnot inside their helmet, but for me, I like to carry maps. Sometimes soldiers will carry a map case. I find they're a little too cumbersome, and quite often in the field, it'll be easier for me to just check what through my helmet than try and bust out my map case, open it up, try and identify where we are. I like to keep it topside. Okay. Um, the jacket I'm wearing is the M41. This is a faithful reproduction through at the front. Uh, it has correct buttons, it's, it's made well, it has a wool interior, cotton outside, uh, proper stitching on all of it. It's very probably one of the best reproductions in the market right now. Uh, additionally, the, every troop was uh, issued the wool shirt underneath. Uh, this is the M37. A lot of the times they'd be gas impregnated. That's why people, when they get their hands on the original wool shirts, are like, oh, it feels so stiff, it feels so uh, uh, like itchy. That's because it was chemically uh, treated. Again, it was a preventative against gas attacks. They figured if it was gas imp uh, chemically impregnated, it would prevent the gas from seeping into the body. That's why a lot of the uniforms are so stiff now. Okay. Uh, in addition to being as old as they are. Mm -hmm. Now, can you go over on the uh, yeah. weaponry? A few of the weapons that we have here is the uh, uh, Caliber 30 U.S. Rifle, also known, known as the M1 Garand. This has a uh, mid-war serial number, so it was probably produced sometime in 1942. Uh, it's gas-operated rifle. It's, as they say, often one of the first, although it's one of the first uh, mass-produced rifle of the war. It shoots a 30 caliber or 30-06 uh, cartridge. I'm sorry, excuse me, a uh, 30-06 uh, 30 bullet. And... Um, as you can see, the action opens here. An eight round on block is placed inside. Once it's closed, you have eight, semi eight rounds in semi-automatic. So as fast as you can essentially pull the trigger, we'll put uh, lead down range. Mm -hmm. uh, basic, very basic idea of it. As soon as the barrel leaves, uh, as soon as the bullet is fired from the cartridge, travels down the barrel, a little gas goes back in here, pushes the piston op rod back to cycle, pick up the next round, so it's ready to fire again, as opposed to bolt-action rifles where every shot you have to work the bolt and close it again. Mm -hmm. I have an 03 Springfield that I'll be able to show you with that in a moment. Um, this is often called one of the greatest weapons ever invented. Patton said it helped win the war. Uh, several million were produced, being the latest being toward the end of Korea, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, although I'm quite knowledgeable about the rifle itself, I am by no means a full expert. There are some people out there uh, individuals with such vast knowledge that they're able to identify every single part and its manufacturing date of when. The knowledge on these rifles is so stellar and the information that can be found online and through a uh, really good gunsmith, someone who's spent a lot of time handling this. I know I recently had this M1 repaired by someone who knew every single serial number's lot, where they came from, which were the best. Some of them had uh, heat treating issues, but there's a whole world in its own of just knowing about the M1 rifle. All right. In, in line with rifles, what we have here is a uh, Springfield Design uh, 1903 rifle produced by Remington. As it says here, U.S. Remington model uh, 1903. Unfortunately, that had been tapped out by someone in chromed barrel. However, very close to what it would have looked like during the war uh, during wartime. Quite often, these were var uh, variations of this rifle were used in the. Um, 1903 A4, which is the sniper variant. As you can see, there's kind of a chip in the rifle there. Uh, but as I mentioned before, where the M1 is gas operated, this is bolt action. So every round fired, you open the bolt, ejects the last round, picks up the next one, and then when you fire, you'd have to open the bolt. Again, that's why it was dramatically, uh, the American war effort was dramatically increased by using the M1 rifle. Mm -hmm. And these were still used though. Yes, in limited number. Quite often they were used by uh, training stateside, that's why we have it here. Often it was used as, um, you would think of a marksman or a sniper, however, uh, that was often only on the company level. Okay. It wasn't every squad had a, a, a sniper, it was they were used on a company level and it was, it was few and far in between. Early war, however, prior to the adaption of the M1 grenade launcher, they had usually one man per squad, per squad had one of these as the grenadier. That's kind of an idea that we forget as Americans, that at one point we needed to have one man in the group designated as the grenadier, meaning the man who could uh, get in close and use, has a... Um, a grenade attachment. A yeah. grenade attachment, correct. So, very sought after, grenade attachment would slide over now. They're incredibly rare because of the fact that mid-war we switched the M1 grenade launcher. 
and it was once it slipped on, you could very easily semi uh, feed in one blank round to fire the grenade. Eventually, the M1 is going to replace that with its own grenade launcher adapter, which again clips over. However, you had to eject the on block and um, to put a new blank round in. If you notice, the uh, four, four hex uh, gas plug here allowed for the grenade launcher to clip on. If I had one present, I would be able to show demonstrate that to you, but uh, unfortunately, I don't have that on me. Okay. And next? Uh, the last item I have here is a uh, 1928 A1 model Thompson, uh, made by Tom uh, Thompson uh, Firearms. It shoots a caliber 45 uh, automatic round. Uh, it, it's rate of fire, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I, I believe is a cl uh, close to 500 rounds a minute. However, you could not effectively shoot it that way. It would overheat, you know, you'd have issues, but it was good for a burst. You see here a 20 round stick mag. Quite often you see in the movies and online they have 30 rounders, but it was more prevalent during the war to see the 20 rounders. Each unit was different. For uh, some specialty units as Rangers and Airborne, were issued these. However, by and large, it sees that you see that most the average soldier wouldn't be carrying this. The average soldier is going to be carrying the M1 rifle. Far too often, you see in the ho in reenacting hobby, guys carrying you know Thompsons, carrying carbines, carrying BARs that probably wouldn't have been issued it. They were issued the rifle. It wasn't a pick. They didn't get to choose what they wanted. Quite often, you hear stories of the, the tiniest guy in the unit carrying the BAR or the uh, the 1919 uh, machine gun. But these, again, these were requisitioned. You could re uh, requisite them. That's why officers tended to carry them. They thought it would make them uh, more effective in combat and they could order it themselves as opposed to the average G.I. Joe would not be able to get his hands on this. Okay. Uh, it has, again, the, for the safeties, you have safe and you have fire. You have full and single. Uh, other variants are just strictly full auto. Okay. Some variants have, like this one has a detachable buttstock. Some people think that was strictly for airborne. Again, with so many variations of the Thompson, this one being the 1928 A1, uh, every, every one of them was quite different. You see the heat shield on this, yeah. the uh, gas compensator, the idea of cutting down the recoil. Some of the later variants did not, like the M1A1 did not have this. It had just straight barrel and no gas compensator also had a bolt on the side as opposed to overhead. Okay. okay. All right, that's basically it. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.